Hello everyone, we're gonna be starting the week one notes in this video today on page 23 in your workbooks. So what we're gonna start with is building on what we did in last week's notes. So just a little recap, we solved equations, we've used the distributive property, we combined like terms, and we were ultimately aiming for that like basic format that we just add or subtract to get one of the terms to the other side and then ultimately divide to get x by itself. So solving equations, your overall goal is to get x by itself and your setup will kind of tell you what you need to start with and guide you through the problem. So every once in a while when you're solving equations, you're going to end up with something um, weird that can happen and that's what we're gonna go over in the beginning of these week three notes. So to start with question 101, can you believe you've already done 100 questions in this course? Okay, so 101 is 4x plus 4 equals 2 times 2x plus 5. Remember something we did go over last week is if you have the distributive property in a problem, you absolutely must do that first. So I do have the distributive property in this problem, and that's what I'm going to start with. So that 2 on the outside of the parentheses is going to get distributed through. This 4x plus 4 on the left side has nothing to do with that, so I'm going to bring that down as well as my equal sign. And then I'm going to multiply to distribute this through. So 2 times 2x is 4x. And then 2 times a positive 5 is going to be a positive 10. So I write plus 10. Now my next word of advice at this step were to be to see how many x's you have and where they are located. So I'm just going to draw this line down my equal sign. I notice there are two x's in this one and they're on opposite sides of the equation. Generally, when they're on opposite sides of the equation, my advice to you was to move the smaller of the two over to the other side by doing that opposite operation. In this case, they're both a positive four, so it doesn't matter which one you move. I'm gonna move this one to the left side. So a positive four X will be canceled by doing the opposite, which is a minus four X. And what you do to one side, you have to do to the other. You know, here's that out of the ordinary situation I was trying to tell you about. So on the right side, we wanted it to cancel. 4x minus 4x cancels, and that's great. On the left side, 4x minus 4x also cancels. So bring down what you're left with. On the left side, it's a 4. You bring down the equals, and on the right side, it's a 10. Now remember, your goal to solve an equation is to get x by itself. In this case, there is no x to solve for anymore, which is what makes it out of the ordinary. Okay, if there's no x to solve for, what do you do? There are two different scenarios when there's no x to solve for once you get to this step. So my x canceled out, I'm left with 4 equals 10. What that tells me and what it should tell you once you get more practice with these problems is that the answer is that there are no solutions. And I'll explain that a little bit further in a minute. Okay, but that just means that there are no solutions because 4 is not equal to 10. Okay, here's why there's no solutions at all. If I go back to this setup, the 4x plus 4 equals 4x plus 10. Remember what we did again talk about last week is every time you get a solution, you can plug it in and check it. So I'm going to make up a solution. Let's say x equals 2. Just checking to see if 2 would work in this equation, I would take that 2 and plug it in everywhere I see an x. So watch what happens. When I plug in a 2, everywhere I see an x. And you have this scenario where there's a 4x and a 4x and they ultimately ended up canceling. Look right here, you have an 8 and you have an 8. That's always going to happen. Even if I made this x equals 3, or x equals 4, or x equals a negative 12, whatever number I plug in, those two things that I'm having highlighted in yellow right now are always going to be the same on the left and the right side. Like I said, I have 4 times 2 right now on both sides, which is going to get me 8 on both sides. I could have 4 times 3 on both sides, which would get me a 12 in that same spot on both sides. Here's why it's no solutions. If you bring down the rest of this, the plus 4 and the plus 10, what I have right here, this 8 and this 8, remember, that's the number that's always going to be the same. It doesn't matter what that number is. If I take this number and add 4 to it, it will never, ever, ever be equal to that exact same number if I add 10 to it. 
So I'll say that again because that's like the overall thing here. So again, what I have highlighted in yellow here and here will always get me the same number on the left and the right side. The difference being if I add four to the left side and I add 10 to the right side, I will never, ever, ever end up with equal sides. So this is just saying 12 is not equal to 18 if I actually finalize that math. Now you're not going to actually plug a number in every time. I want you to recognize this scenario and think back to this example that we did. If I plugged in three, if I plugged in four, if I plugged in the rest of the numbers forever and ever, ultimately what you're going to have is this number being the same as this number and you're adding different values to each side so it will never ever be equal. That is why the solution is actually that there are no solutions. Now I said there are two different scenarios we can end up with, so I'm gonna show you another one over here. I'm just gonna get rid of my mess here. Okay, so number 102. Notice it does have the same setup where there's the distributive property first, so I'm going to start with that, just like I did for the last example. The left side just comes down, 9x minus 30 is equal to, and when I distribute that through, three times three x is going to be a nine x, and three times negative 10 is going to be a negative 30. You might already see it now that the left side and the right side are identical to each other. I'm gonna take it one step further because you aren't typically looking for an out of the ordinary situation. It just happens sometimes. So if I was solving a regular equation on a test or a quiz or whatever, at this point I would notice that I have two x's and they are on opposite sides of my equation, so I need to do the opposite operation to get them together. So the opposite of a positive 9x is a minus 9x, and notice that they do end up canceling on both sides again. So what I'm left with on the left side is a negative 30, bring down your equal sign, and on the right side I'm left with a negative 30 as well. So here's why this one's different than the last problem that we just did. They're actually equal here. Whereas 4 was not equal to 10, over here I have negative 30 equals negative 30. That works. Okay, so why is that different than the first one? Your answer for number 102 is actually going to be that there are infinite solutions. Infinite just means there is an endless amount of solutions. That's a fine answer too. If you don't like the word infinite, endless is a great word. There are so many solutions, they're uncountable. Okay, and here's why. I'm gonna show you just what I showed you with this step right here. I have the nine X minus 30 equals the nine X minus 30. And just to stay consistent, I'm gonna plug in X equals two again. You could plug in x equals 3, you could plug in x equals 4. It's just to show you a little bit further what's happening here with these out-of-the-ordinary situations. It's kind of the same idea as the last one. Whereas if I plug in a 2 everywhere I see an x, watch how this math works. Right here and right here, again, are the same number on the left and the right side, just like the last example. If I do 9 times 2, I get 18 bring down the minus 30. Over here, nine times two again is 18, and the minus 30 comes down. So again, even if I plugged in a three right here, or a five, or a 12, or whatever, this number and this number will match. Now, if I have those matching numbers, but in this case, I subtract 30 from both of them, 18 minus 30 is going to get me a negative 12 on both sides, and that actually does check out. So when you plug a solution into an equation and it works like this, where they are equal to each other, that means that x equals 2 is a solution. But x equals 2 is not your only solution. I could then plug in 1, and it would get me the same situation. I could plug in 7. I could plug in 1 half. There are infinitely many options. I could plug in for x that would make the left side equal to the right side, which is the ultimate goal of solving an equation. What's the x value that will work? In this case, every single number you could possibly think of, even negatives. You could do negative one half, negative seven. The numbers that are um, possible solutions are endless, infinite solutions, so this would be your answer. Okay, something that happens quite often is on a test or a quiz when people come up with a question that looks like this, they get to this point right here and they don't write the answer. This that I'm circling right now is not your answer. 
this, writing out no solutions and writing out infinite solutions, that is your answer, not this. That's the proper work. You need to get full credit, so absolutely show that. Okay, but this is what I have start at the bottom here, here and here. That's your actual solution. Okay, so taking this solving equation um, process and all the skills that we've acquired so far and going a little bit further with it with something called literal equations. Okay, if you kind of look ahead at the next six problems on this page, you'll notice that there's more letters than we're used to in most of the problems. Actually, in all of the problems. Nope, all but one, I should say. They have no numbers at all. Okay, so what we're going to do is use that process of solving an equation that we're used to but you're going to be using that process with other variables. It seems like a weird concept, but it's honestly the same steps. Okay, so I'm gonna start you off with number 103. The biggest thing that you need to take note of is which of the variables you're solving for. Normally, you're solving for the letter that's in the problem, but if you have three or four different letters in a problem, you need to focus on which one you're solving for. So if you look at question 103, it says G equals CA, and then there's a comma. It's telling you to solve it for the letter A. So essentially, we're solving for A for question 103. Okay, so remember, when you're solving for a variable, your goal is to get it by itself. So I'm trying to get this A alone. When you have like a number in front of an A, let's, for instance, just go over here and draw a random example where those letters, G and C, are actually numbers. Notice it's the same setup. C is just two and G is 12. I made up those numbers just to kind of help you see what's going on here. Okay, C is two, G is 12, made up those numbers. But I left A because A is what we're solving for. Okay, when you have the situation right here where there is something directly next to the A, it means they're being multiplied. To undo that multiplication, you divide by that thing it's being multiplied by. So it's the same situation for the letters. The C and the A right here are directly next to each other, which means they're being multiplied. If your goal is to get A by itself and it's being multiplied by C, to undo times C, you're going to divide by C. You see? <laughs> so over here, the twos would cancel out. You'd be left with A, and 12 divided by 2 is 6, and that's actually your final answer. And I know I'm done because A is by itself. So same thing over here when I bring it back to the letters. C divided by C cancels out, and you're left with A. But the problem with this is you can't actually do G divided by C. There's no mathematical answer here. You can't plug it in your calculator. So what it is is just G over C. I know it's an ugly answer. But that's your final answer. You can't simplify it any further than that. You just know that you're done because A is by itself. All right, so let's work on the next one. It goes over to the right. So the next one we're going to work with is the area of a triangle formula, which is A equals 1 half BC. Or BH, whoops. A equals one half BH, sorry, <laughs> I distracted myself. Okay, so what you have to do is focus on what you're solving for. This one's saying to solve for H, so that means you're trying to get just that H by itself. So notice what's in the way here. On that side of the equal sign that's not an H is a one half and a B. You wanna get both of those over to the other side. It does not matter which one you do first. And please remember, we don't do a lot of fractions in this course. So you probably would not see something like this one on a test or a quiz, specifically the one with fractions. So let's get rid of the B first because I don't like fractions. It is what it is. We'll save it till the end. So same situation. Look at what's happening between the B and the H. Just like the last one, they are being multiplied to each other because there's no symbol between them. So to undo that multiplication, I am going to divide both sides by B. So the B completely cancels on the right side. On the left side, I have to leave it as A over B because I can't simplify that down. My equal sign comes down and so does everything, that else, everything else that is left. So the 1 half and the H both come down.
you know, if you recall from the very beginning of the week two notes, to get rid of a fraction, you have to multiply by its flip, or the fancy math term for it is to multiply by its reciprocal. The flip or the reciprocal of one half is just two. So to get rid of that one half, I'm going to multiply both sides by two. One half times two is just one. So that's why that trick works. They cancel each other out in a way and it would leave you with one H, but I'm just gonna write H. And again, I can't multiply A divided by B by two, so I just leave it as is. Two times A over B equals H and I am done because I solved for H. H is by itself, so that is my final answer. Some of you that don't like the way that answer looks, it's absolutely more simplifiable, if that is a word. Two times AB, when you multiply any fractions, you want to just multiply straight across. So two times A and one times B would get you two A over B equals H. Either one of these answers is fine. You don't have to simplify it further. What's kind of nice actually about these literal equations where there's more letters than numbers is there isn't any math. You don't have to divide or be careful of negatives or anything like that. It's just, you just keep bringing it down. Like we brought down the AB and then we brought this down. There's really no like mathematics. I don't want to say there's no mathematics, but it's, it's more letters and not numerical. Okay, the next one we're going to do is 105, so take it back over here to the left side of the page. It says u is equal to k t um, over a, and you have to solve that for a. So we're trying to get a by itself. Okay, so this one's kind of a weird one. Your goal to get the letter by itself is to do opposite operations. But for this one, nothing's happening to a. Something's happening with the a. So looking at this, you definitely want to get the K to the other side. But you can't undo what's happening with the K because it's not like A divided by K where the opposite would be multiplying. They're flip-flopped. The only thing you can do with this problem at this point is get rid of the divided by A. Once you do that, you'll actually see the next step much clearer. So the opposite of dividing by A is to multiply both sides by a. Remember, opposites cancel things out. So k divided by a, if I multiply that by a, the a's will cancel, which seems ridiculous because we're trying to solve for a, but you just kind of brought it to the other side in a way. a times u is going to be left on the left side, and that's just going to be equal to k. Again, I know that was a weird situation. You're used to doing the opposite. This one's definitely a tougher one. But look at where you're at now. If you're trying to get that A by itself, even though it moved to the other side, you only have one step left. A is being multiplied by U, and the opposite of multiplying by U is to divide by U. So that these U's will cancel. A comes down, and it's by itself, and you just leave it equals K over U. We will do one more like that, I believe. It's definitely tougher, but yes, we will. Okay, so 106, next one we're gonna work on. I is equal to PRT, that is a simple interest formula. That's just a fun fact, by the way. You don't need to memorize that. Just fun fact, if you don't think it's fun, you can just cross that right out. We're going to solve this equation for r. So your goal is to get r by itself. We're actually going to use a quick shortcut for this one. So if your goal is to get r by itself, look at what's happening to r. p and t are in the way. They're in the way because they're being multiplied to r, and they're both being multiplied. So what you can do is obviously the opposite of multiplication is division. So I'm going to divide both sides by both of them. You can do it one at a time, it just gets a little messy, so it's easier to just divide by them both at once, because if you look, P's cancel, the T's cancel, and you already have R by itself. Okay, because everything was being multiplied, you can divide by P, T, and on the left side, it's just gonna stay I over P, T, and that's your final answer. You got R by itself, so you are done. If you're looking back and wondering why we didn't do that for this one, for 104, we had A equals 1 half B H. 
So if you're trying to solve for h like we were, it was being multiplied by b and 1 half. You could divide by 1 half b, but what's going to happen if you do that is this is very, very ugly. You have a fraction within a fraction. So your overall answer would have been a over 1 half b equals h. It's like mathematically just wrong to have this fraction within a whole fraction. See how there's two fraction lines here? You want to avoid that at all costs because that can definitely be simplified further. So that's why we didn't do it up here. Definitely get in the habit of doing something like that, though, because like I said, you're not going to see many fractions on tests and quizzes. All right, number 107. This one we are solving for a... I'm trying to get A by itself. Why don't you try and give this one a try on your own? Okay, so pause the video, give yourself a couple minutes to work on this one if you need it, and then play the video when you're ready. Okay, so if I'm trying to solve for A, A is being multiplied by M. To undo multiplying by M, I'm going to divide both sides by M. And you have to divide the whole side by M. That's why this one's a little bit trickier. It might have seemed kind of easy, like it's just division, but it's because that whole side over here needs to be divided by m. What you do to one side, you have to do to the other side, the whole darn thing. So these m's cancel, a comes down, and then this stays n plus p over m, and you have solved for a now. You got a by itself, so that's your final answer. Another way some people prefer to write this if you want, because you are technically dividing the whole right side, by m, you can separate the terms. That's more of a matter of um, habit. If you had to do that back in your previous math classes, you might prefer this. If that looks more confusing to you, then just ignore it and stick with this. It's really just whatever you're used to. So I keep showing you a couple of different scenarios. Like it could be this or this, it could be this or this. Your ultimate goal and the reason that you'll know that you're done is if you have the variable by itself. That's the ultimate goal. If you have the variable by itself, you have finished the problem. So this next one is a little bit trickier as well. So g is equal to x minus c plus y, and you're trying to solve it for x, which means you're trying to get x by itself. So there's a minus c and a plus y in the way. You have to get both of them to the other side to so get that x by itself. And you get things to the opposite side by doing the opposite operation. So it doesn't matter which one you decide to get rid of first. I'm going to start with the minus C. So the opposite of minus C is plus C. So I'm going to add C to both sides so that these cancel out. Now be very careful how you bring this down. Bring it down how you read it. That is the best advice I can give you. So this over here on the left side, I would read that as G plus C. So I'm going to bring it down as G plus C. Then my equal sign comes down, my x comes down, but those c's were canceled, so the plus y is all that comes down after that. What a lot of people do with this g plus c is they write gc. That's incorrect because it's not being added. When they're next to each other like this, that means they're being multiplied, and that's not what we have here. When we moved the c over, we added it, so you have to bring down that plus sign as well to stay correct. And then remember, your goal is to still get that x by itself. We are one step closer. We just have to get rid of that plus y. To undo plus y, I'm going to subtract y to both sides. Again, bring it down how you would read this. I have g plus c minus y equals x. Okay, so g plus c minus y equals x is my final answer, and I know that because I got x by itself. My overall goal was to solve for x. If you prefer to write it with the x on the left side, that's fine. Same answer, it doesn't really matter. Okay, a couple more of those on the next page. So number 109, just continuing with this. Okay, what I have here is a much longer equation that I have to solve for a. This is one of those ones that's weird like 105 was, where the a was in the denominator, or the bottom of a fraction, if you're unfamiliar with that term. Okay, so a is down here in the denominator, and I have to get it by itself. 
So technically nothing's happening to A specifically, but remember what we did talk about in week two notes? I said it a million times and you got really annoyed with me. You always get rid of what's being added or subtracted first. So even though we have this situation that we had in 105 right here, I still have to get rid of that B first before I even focus on what's in the blue circle. So it's a positive B. To get that to the other side, I'm going to subtract B from both sides. Bring this down exactly how you read it. It's Z minus B. The equal sign comes down, and then I'm just going to bring down what's left, which is a positive M over A. Now, at this point, you want so badly to get rid of the M, but nothing's happening to the A. You can't get rid of the M so easily. It's not like A is being divided by M. You have to end up getting the A to the other side in this case. So what we did last time, if you recall, oh man, I was doing pretty good that time. Um, <laughs> if you recall from the last example, to get that A to the other side so it's workable, we multiplied by A. We got M by itself first, and I know that sounds confusing, but right now there's nothing else I can do to get the A by itself. So to get M by itself and move the A over, M is being divided by A, so I multiply by A on both sides. Okay, so it canceled on the right side. I'm just going to bring down the left side exactly how I see it. And this is what I end up with when those A's cancel out on the right. You might be noticing that the distributive property applies here. It sure does, but you don't want to apply it to this problem because of our next step. Remember, your goal is to get A by itself. If you distribute A through to this, you're going to get ZA minus BA, and now you have two A's. You don't want two A's. So you want to avoid distributing for this one, and I know that seems weird, but it's for the end goal here. You want A by itself. Right now, kind of use the distributive <laughs> The distributive property to your advantage, A is being multiplied by Z minus B. So to undo multiplying it by Z minus B, I'm going to divide it by Z minus B. So that the whole Z minus B cancels out. You're left with A by itself is equal to M over Z minus B as your final answer. That is as hard as literal equations in this course are going to get, and typically just a hint for you for everything in the future, I don't usually give you the hardest possible scenario on a test or a quiz. So if that one really threw you, it's okay. Definitely try to understand it so you really get a grasp for the easier ones, but you're not going to see something like that difficult level um, on a test or a quiz. Maybe this next one though. So this one's a little bit harder as well, definitely not as tough as the last one. So 110 says u equals 3b minus 2a plus 2, and we have to solve it for a. So if you look at where that a is and where your equal sign is, look at how many things are in the way of a being by itself. You have 3b, that negative 2 in front of it, and the plus 2. That is a lot that we have to get over to the other side. The order that you move them, order, <laughs> that you move them over in is very important. So your goal is to get the A by itself. Remember, you have to get rid of what's being added or subtracted first. So there's a couple of things being added or subtracted to this. What you want to focus on is the thing that's not. This negative 2 is being multiplied to the A. So you do not want to move that over in the beginning. You do want to move over this plus 2 and this 3B because they're both being added or subtracted, but in this case added, to that negative 2 times a. So it doesn't matter which one you move over first. I'm just going to get rid of this 2 because it's nice and easy. It's a plus 2. I'm going to move it over by subtracting 2. Remember over here on the left side, bring it down how you read it. u minus 2. So I write u minus 2. The equal sign comes down and so does everything on the right side. But keeping in mind, I'm saving that negative 2a for last. So my next step is to get that 3b over to the other side. It's a positive 3b, so to undo it, I'm going to subtract 3b from both sides. And like I said before, bring down the left side how you would read this. And I know it's kind of long here. Okay, but it's going to be u minus 2 minus 3b is how I would read that. 
equals, I'm left with negative 2a on the right side. Okay, now I can finally, I'm at that last step, I can get rid of that negative 2, which is being multiplied to the a. To undo multiplication, you divide. So I'm going to divide by negative 2 on both sides. That negative 2 will cancel. Be very careful, too. It's not a plus 2 to get rid of it because it's being multiplied. Even though it's a negative, you're multiplying by a negative 2. So to undo multiplying, you divide. Okay, that leaves you with just the a on the right side. And I'm just going to bring this down exactly how I see it. And that is my final answer. And I know it's my final answer because a is by itself. I do want to show you, so this is your answer, u minus 2 minus 3b over negative 2 equals a. One of the previous simplifying I showed you is that this can also be rewritten as u over negative 2 minus 2 over negative 2 minus 3b over negative 2. Like you can put that negative 2 with all of the terms on the top if you feel so obligated to separate it like that. Again, some people got in that habit back in their previous math classes. Other people are like, why on earth would you do that? It just depends the level of math you reached because sometimes that's actually more helpful. In this case it is, but this answer is perfectly fine. Here's why it's a little bit better to do it like this for this example. Okay, Notice right here that negative 2 divided by negative 2 ultimately gets you 1. Anything divided by itself is 1. So you can simplify this to u over negative 2 plus 1 minus 3b over negative 2 equals a. To some people that might still look more complicated. Honestly, I agree with you. I still think this side is definitely the easier way to go, but it's completely up to you. My advice is the second you get the variable by itself, you're done. Box it in and call it a day. Don't try and simplify it further. Don't like think these cancel because they don't. You have to put the negative 2 with all of them. Just stop. The second you get that variable by itself, done. Okay, so that is literal equations for you. So moving right along with some more equation work is inverse, but we are not going to do inverse. So just a reminder of what I told you previously, if I do this on the notes where I completely cross a problem out, boom, it's gone. That means when you see inverse questions on your homework, you don't have to do them. If you want to, obviously, by all means, but you are never going to be quizzed or tested on something that I don't go over with you. So you will not see an inverse question on any assessment you receive in this course. Okay, so moving right along to this fun thing everybody loves called word problems. Okay, word problems are not so bad when you really space it out and focus on what's given that is relevant and important. So the directions say use clues in the word problems to write an equation describing the situation and solve if necessary. So if it asks you to solve, we're going to solve, but otherwise we're just going through and writing equations based on the words. So in other words, it's kind of like translating. We're translating these word problems to algebra. Okay. So 115 part A says Anne took a taxi home from the airport. The taxi fare was $2.10 per mile, and she gave the driver a tip of $5 and paid a total of $49.10. So the biggest, most important word in this problem is this right here, per. Per tells you that that number, that $2.10, is not going to stay $2.10. It is going to change per whatever unit this is. Sometimes it'll be per inch, per foot, per whatever on earth it is talking about per year, anything. If you see the word per or something similar to per, that's going to be your changing number. It changes based on this unknown thing and unknown things in math we refer to as variables. So I'm going to call miles M. So that $2.10, $2.10, I'm going to put that with an M. Okay, so what that does when I do $2.10 times M, it's going to multiply that dollar amount by the number of miles. If we go five miles, it'll be $2.10 times five miles, and that will get you the total amount spent on the miles. Now, the next significant number in this problem is the tip. 
there's a tip of five dollars you don't pay the tip based on the miles that's why there's no per word here it's not five dollars per mile you just give them a tip of five dollars period that's it but it still needs to be included in this so on top of or in addition to that two dollars and ten cents per mile was another five dollar tip and when you add that all together you get the total of forty nine dollars and ten cents And that's your equation. Once you write an equation, it is beneficial to you to just make sure that it makes sense. $2.10 times, let's say we're doing two miles. If you multiply that by two, that would make sense for how much you're spending per those two miles, plus the $5 tip. And it should, it's not two, but if it was, it would get you your total, which makes sense. So we're logically good to move on. Part B actually wants us to solve for it. So it says using this equation, find the distance between the airport and Anne's home. That's going to be M, the number of miles between the two. So 2.10 M plus five, just rewriting the equation, is equal to $49.10. Luckily, this is already in that basic format, so I'm good to now solve it for M. To get M by itself, Remember, get rid of what's being added or subtracted first. Isn't it nice to be back to numbers for a little bit? So to get rid of that plus 5, I'm going to subtract the 5 from both sides so that these 5s cancel. On the left side of my equation, the 2.10m comes down. And then 49.10 minus 5, if you're not great with decimals, just go ahead and throw that in your calculator. But it's just going to take 5 away from the 49, which will leave you with $44.10. Again, M is not by itself, it's being multiplied by 2.10, so I'm going to divide it by 2.10 on both sides so that those cancel out because anything divided by itself is a 1, or just leaving that as an M. So M is going to equal, you'll probably want to plug that into your calculator, and when you do, you should get 21. So that means that she was 21 miles away from the airport. Now, if you want, you can plug that back in for M to make sure that you solved the equation correctly. You should get 49.10 equals 49.10 to show that it works in the equation. Any equation is checkable. All right, moving on to the next equation. I have 331 students went on a field trip. Six buses were filled and seven students traveled in cars. How many students were in each bus? Okay, so look at this question here. The thing that's being asked is always going to be your unknown because that's what it's asking you is to figure out what the answer is. So when it says how many students were in each bus, that's your variable. And I'm just going to call it B. So in this case, we're going to say that B is the number of students Now I'm going to change the wording and say per bus. So I know they said in each bus, that's another way of saying per, but I'm going to change it to that word because that's the word we just talked about in the last example. Okay, so this one is a little bit different. It says there are six buses. And B represents the number of students on each bus. And the overall problem is asking about a total number of students, which we'll get to that number in a little bit, that 331. But right now there's six buses and B represents the number of students per bus. So those are the numbers that are going to go together. Six B. Because let's, for instance, just to help you kind of understand this, it's not the right number, but I'm just going to use an easy number and say there's 10 students on each bus. If there's six buses and each of them is filled with 10 students, 6 times 10 would get you 60, and that would tell you how many total students are on the buses. So that's why those two numbers go together. And when I say two numbers, I mean 6 and B. It's that arbitrary number we don't know yet. Okay, so this is a number of students, ultimately, once we would plug in B. And there's seven more students that traveled in cars. Okay, so on top of 6B, however many students that is, there was an additional seven students that traveled in cars. So I'm going to add seven to that. 
Now when I have the total number of students on the bus plus the seven students on the car, I will end up with my total number of students that went on the field trip, which is 331. Now we wrote out the equation, but this one was asking us a question to actually solve for B, the thing that we don't know. We called it B because it was our variable, our unknown. So take a second to try and solve this one on your own. Pause the video, follow the steps, and get this one solved. Okay, so you want to get rid of what's being added or subtracted first. So I'm going to subtract the 7 from both sides. That'll leave me with 6B equals 324. Now 6 is being multiplied by b, so to get b by itself, I'm going to divide by that 6, and I end up with b equals 54 students. So that means that there are 54 students on each of the 6 buses, plus those 7 students that traveled in cars got us a total of 331. You can plug it back in to make sure you did the math right. Every equation is checkable. Something else that's really, really nice about solving word problems is you want to make sure the number makes sense. It's like you have that opportunity. Like in the last one, 21 miles makes sense for how far you are away from an airport. If you got like 9 million or negative 40, those kinds of numbers wouldn't make sense. And clearly you did the math wrong at some point. And same thing for buses. Like you've seen a bus before. You've probably even been on one. You know about how many students would fit on a bus. If you're getting some wild numbers in like the thousands or even hundreds, it just wouldn't make sense. Definitely not negatives either. We don't want decimals. <laughs> Okay, the next one, Aaliyah, or Aaliyah, had $24 to spend on seven pencils. After buying them, she had $10. How much did each pencil cost? So again, the question is your variable. How much did each pencil cost? I'm going to call that P, which is the cost of a pencil. It's just the unknown thing. P is the cost of a pencil. This is a lot like the last one. She bought seven pencils at this price. It cost that much per the pencil, and there were seven of them. So those are the things that are going to go together. Seven P, because you would multiply the cost of one pencil by seven to get the overall cost of pencils. Here's why this one's a little bit different. She started out with $24 and then she spent money. So I'm actually going to put the $24 that she started with in the beginning of my equation because that just makes sense. And then from that $24, she spent money. If you're spending, that means you're losing money. This is going to be a subtraction problem. So $24 minus how much she spent on the seven pencils. Once she spent that money or after buying them, she was left with or equals $10. Again, it's translating words to algebra. And now we're in that step where it's like that basic form and we can go ahead and solve it, get rid of what's being added or subtracted first. Go ahead and pause if you want to get some more practice. I'm just going to jump right into it. The thing that's being added or subtracted is the 24 and it's a positive 24. So I'm going to subtract 24 from both sides. My negative 7P and my equals comes down and 10 minus 24 is a negative 14. To get P by itself, last step, divide by negative 7 to make sure that cancels out. Anything has to be divided by itself to cancel. And you end up with P equals negative 14 divided by negative 7 is 2. And remember what P represented. It was money. So it's $2 per pencil, which is a little bit ridiculous, but it's definitely a realistic answer. It better be a cool pencil, though. Something that wouldn't be realistic is, let's say I accidentally missed this negative. I would have gotten negative $2. Negative $2 per pencil doesn't make sense. Okay, 118, I want you to try entirely on your own. So pause the video, give 118 a complete try on your own, write out the equation, and solve it.
Okay, so the question here is how old is Sarah? Pause the video if you need more time or if you didn't already. So how old is Sarah is my unknown, I'm gonna call that A. It's just Sarah's age. And I'm just making up these letters. You could have called it S for Sarah if you want. I used A for age. You could use O to find out how old she is. It's entirely up to you. Okay, so A is what I'm trying to find. It's Sarah's age. It says if 494, so that's what I'm starting with, is reduced by. Reduced means subtraction. So I'm subtracting three times her age. This one's way more spelled out than the last ones were. Three times her age, and her age is known as A. So three times A is going to go there. Is is a really nice way of knowing that that's your answer. Is is equals 419. Okay, hopefully this is the equation that we got. Again, it's 494 reduced by, so subtracting 3A is your final answer, 419. So to solve this, get rid of what's being added or subtracted first. I'm going to subtract, whoops, 494 from both sides so that that cancels out. When you bring this down, make sure you bring down the negative with it. So negative 3A comes down and 419 minus 494 is a negative 75. And then to get that A by itself, I'm going to divide by negative 3 on both sides and you get A equals a positive 25. Same situation here, if I brought down the pos a positive three instead and I didn't divide by a negative, I'd get a negative 25. It doesn't make sense to be negative 25 years old. So that's one way that you can just kind of make sure your math is right and check, but of course you can always go back and plug it in. As long as your original written equation is right, you can guarantee yourself that that answer is right. So 25 years old is how old Sarah is. And you may have already seen it, but in case you didn't, your code word is going to be SMART. For this video, your code word is SMART. Okay, and that is actually where we're going to end the video for today. So make sure you write down that code word and we'll pick right back up at this point in the next part of the video.